Yeah. Oh, okay, that works too. Um, so Kishore is recording it. Can everybody see my slides still? Okay. Yep. Sweet. All right. Uh, let's get the show on the road. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Python Crash Course Workshop for the Alex Wapenko Group. Um, we are going to be doing a rapidly quick introduction to Python. We're going to cover like all the basics and then some. Um, this is normally something that takes me at least uh, like two to three hours to cover, but I'm going to try and cover it in an hour. So we might go overboard. I'll let everybody know when we're at the um, four o'clock mark so they can leave if they're here uh, in person, but it will be recorded for your uh, watching, uh, for your pleasure of watching. I also want to let everybody know that I sent out an email with uh, assignment materials that are optional. You can totally do them if you want to. I encourage you to do them if you don't know Python because it will really help you build your understanding. Um, as well as there are two resource guides on plotting as well as just the fundamentals to, um, for you to reference when you do the assignment. So um, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started right away because this is a lot. Uh, there we go. So the plan, uh, we're gonna talk about Python basics. We're gonna go over variable and data types. Then we're gonna go into functions, how to use those uh, variables and data types. And then we're gonna talk about conditional statements and while loops and for loops and then objects. And those are all the Python basics we're gonna talk about. And then after that, we're gonna talk about external capabilities. These are importing libraries. Um, how do you use external codes that other people have written, libraries that we implement into our own code to speed up our processes and make, um, make our codes a lot more powerful. Being able to do linear algebra, plot, make pretty plots and do um, like curve fitting is all examples of that. So we'll talk about that after we cover the basics. And then I don't anticipate this, but we might be able to do demos if I have time. I don't think so, though. Um, so let's get into it. What is a variable? Uh, a way, it's just a way of storing information in the computer. We call this information data. And this data can have different data types. These data types can be a wide range of different things. For example, x is equal to 7. Y can be equal to some string or some name. Um, Z can be a list of, of different numbers or letters or anything, really. Um, however you want to store information, you can store it on a computer in these different data types. So how the way you do this, you declare a variable name on the left hand side of an equal sign. That's the, what we call the variable and that's how we reference it later in our code. And the right hand side, sorry about that, the right hand side is the value that you want it to be. And this could either be like things like an integer, it could be floats, it could be strings, it could be a list. It could be a tuple, it could be a dictionary. And we'll go over those a little bit. Integers are pretty self-explanatory. You can take in math classes. Integers are whole numbers, basically. Um, floats, decimal point values, 1.27 is definitely a float. Um, strings is like characters that you would type, A, B, C, D, words separated by spaces. The way you create a string is using quotation marks, and it treats it as if it's a word expression or a letter expression, not a number. Lists is just a um, like grouping of a bunch of different data, data values. And Python is really nice. You can put whatever data values you want in a list. You could put one, two, and then a, and then seven, and then 1.25. It doesn't really care um, because Python is very high level and it's very smart. So it knows what you are trying to do when you put different things in a list. Um, a list is pretty self-explanatory. It's just a list of objects that the Python is keeping track of. Um, and we call that a variable, or we, we set that to a variable name so that we can keep track of an entire list with just one variable name. Um, tuples are just, kind of more strict lists. Um, they're non-changeable or non-immutable uh, or non or immutable is the, is the right word. Um, you can't edit them really. Um, so they're kind of stricter. Typically you won't need to know how to use tuples. They're basically the exact same thing as a list just with some key differences, but that's not really important for the sake of this talk. Um, I encourage you to Google Stack Exchange, go on Stack Exchange and look at the differences between tuples and lists if you're really curious. Um, but I don't think it's really worth that much time. And then there's dictionaries. And this is kind of like the last key data type that we talk about when we talk about Python. And a dictionary is very much how it sounds. Uh, you, it's keeping track of different keys and their values, just like how a dictionary has keys and values in the form of words and definitions. A dictionary in Python can hold different values for for specific keys so for example you have you want to set a name or, or you have you want to have a list of different data um names for different stars for example sn 1987a supernova 1987a that you can reference that as a key by a string and and then to access like information about it 
maybe a list of like the RA and DEC and a whole bunch of other things, um, you can put that as its value. And you can have lots of those different keys and values. We're not gonna talk so much about dictionaries as well in this, um, in this uh, workshop because I'm just, they're just not super, super important. They're more of a um, back burner or optional thing you can use instead of lists if you're a bit more proficient. But the main key ones to know our integers, floats, strings, and lists. That's kind of um, the backbone of Python for everything we're going to be talking about today. And then the other two are more or less um, complications or alternate um, data types that you can use for other scenarios. So uh, how do we use these variables and data types? Well, there's many ways, but um, typically we think of them as being implemented into functions and loops because they are the most important tools in programming. Um, that's kind of like what a computer is good at. It's really good at handling data. And it's our job to tell the computer what we want to do with that data. Maybe that's to convert the data from one, like one form and then manipulate it to give it us another form, like applying f of x to an x value and spitting out the, the, the output of that. Or maybe it's doing the same task over and over and over again with slight variations. Um, humans, we could do it, but it's really mundane and boring. And we obviously don't really want to spend a lot of time adding one to a thousand different numbers. Um, but, a, but a computer is extremely good at that. In fact, it could do millions of those operations a second, depending on what computer you're using. So that's really useful, and we want to take advantage of that. So, with the, so the way we take advantage of that first was a function. Um, how do you write a function? Well, this is how you do it. Uh, it always starts with a definition statement. We call this the, or like I, we call it the defining or definition statement, and it's denoted as this DEF you see on the screen here. I guess I should use a, a laser pointer. Um, this DEF right here is the def like is how you start writing a function DEF, and then every function has its name. So calcdist is the name of this function, and then every function also has its arguments. There can be one argument, there can be multiple arguments. You can specify traits about these arguments. You can tell it it needs to be an integer. You can tell it needs to be a list. Um, but Python's pretty smart, so you don't always have to do that. But it can take in multiple arguments or just one argument, um, and these could be lists, they can be integers, they could be floats, they could be strings. It really depends on how you're writing your function and what you want to do with it. So after that, you have the body of your function. So this is kind of the, the meat of what's going on inside of your function. These are the calculations that it's doing. Um, different functions can be written differently, but almost all of them have like a function body. So in this case, the body of this function, this calc distance function, I'm calculating the distance in the, in the body of it. It takes in these two, um, these two arguments, it, it adds them in quadrature, and then squares roots it. Um, and that gives you the distance. This is just the, uh, x squared plus y squared and then square root. That's just the distance we all learn in high school algebra. Or yeah, I think it's high school algebra. And then it always ends with a return statement. You always have to either return something or return nothing. Um, but you do have to have a returning statement for good practice. So in this case, our function needs to return a value or else Python won't tell me what the distance is. I need, I would need it to return it back to me so I can use it for later use. So it will end with a return distance statement that we can then once we calculate or call this calculate distance function between or with two uh, differences between X and Y, it'll give me the distance and I can use that later in my code if I wanted to. So then what is a loop, right? We talked about functions and now we need to talk about loops. These are the two main things that um, computers are really good at doing with code. So to use a loop or what is a loop, um, it's like, or how, I guess the question is how do you tell the computer to repeat operations over and over and over again? Um, you might want to make it do something over and over until a condition is met, for example, and it could loop over a list of items to check if they are what we want them to be. Um, there's lots of different examples of this. I can think of a hundred of them, um, but we're gonna go over a couple of different ones. So how do you write a loop? Well, we'll start with what's called a while loop. So this is kind of the a heuristic view of how you code a while loop. So while some condition is true, um, this equals equals sign is like a comparing operator. So it, it or a conditional operator. So it, it, what it's doing is comparing this condition and trying to see if it's true or false. Maybe that's x is greater than five. Maybe that's x is equal to zero. Maybe that's um, one plus one is true. I don't know. Or one plus one is equal to two, if that's true. It, you can have tons of different conditions or whatever, depending on what your code is. 
So while this condition is equal to true, you do some stuff and then you do some other stuff maybe, and then make some sort of change to the condition so that you don't get stuck in an infinite loop. And this some sort of change is always really crucial when you're using a while loop. Um, because if you don't do it, what's gonna happen is your computer is gonna always have this condition be true. It's gonna keep going through your while loop over and over and over and over again. And it will never stop until you can't, like you cut the program or you um, cancel it or you close the application or the terminal. So um, it's very important that you make sure you do some sort of change to the condition at the end of your while loop. Um, and whatever you wanna do inside of your while loop, whatever you wanna do each time you call it, it's gonna be depending on what, what, what you're trying to do with your code, but it's gonna do some stuff that, that we know that. So how do we make a condition in Python? This is a little bit tricky to, to, uh, of a concept to think about, but it's okay, I think we, we can cover it. So conditional statements is kind of how we make a, is how we make a condition. So if we want to make some sort of condition that the computer has to meet in order to do an operation, we would do it with an if statement. So if or an else statement. If x is equal to seven, do something. Otherwise, that's what we denote by else, you can print x is so not equal to seven. Um, do like otherwise do something else. So if this condition is true, x is equal to seven, notice that we're not using one single equals. That's how you denote what a variable is, but two equals is comparing two things together. So if x is equal to seven, then print this condition. Otherwise do or print something else. So this is a classic conditional statement. Now there's also, just want to note, you can also add in what's called an L if statement. It's short for else if, and it's just like a second if statement. Um, if x is equal to seven, do this. Then you can have another specific case, not just a, a catch all case, but maybe it's a as if x is equal to nine case, some other special case. You use an elif for that, and then you can have some other condition. And then you have a catch all statement saying if all else fails, do this. So this is a conditional statement here. Um, so I just want to give you a little a little example of a while loop. So let's start with declaring a variable x. We'll say that it's equal to zero when we start. And while x is less than seven, we want to actually print what x is and then increment x by one each time. So what this will end up doing is when it runs, it'll actually spit out zero, then one, then two, then three, then four, then five, and then six in that order. Because what it's doing is it's starting at as x is equal to zero and it's incrementing by one each time in this while loop. This is what the computer's really good at doing. And if you have a lot of stuff it needs to do, maybe you need to want to say X is less than a thousand, X is less than a million. The computer can do that much, much better than any human ever, much faster than any human ever could. So um, what we're doing is incrementing by X is equal to one each time. Notice that this is that crucial part of changing something for the condition. So in our conditional statement, we're comparing X to seven. But if x never changed, if we never had this x is equal to x plus one, what would happen is this while loop would actually get stuck and run forever because x is never changing. So x is always less than seven. In fact, x is always equal to zero. And you would just get an infinite number of zeros running on your computer until you cut the program. So just really quick, we have the while. This is like while uh, denotes you're starting a while loop. Um, and then we have a condition. And then don't forget your colon. And then tab inward. Uh, on the next line and you can do whatever you want to do. In this case, print is just a function that takes in X as the argument. And what it does is it prints it on screen. It's just a very basic implemented uh, function that's already inside of Python. And then you could do X is equal to X plus one um, to increment X each time. So you get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or six. Cool. So then there's four loops. We talked about while loops and this is, while loops are loops that do, do this loop over and over and over again until a condition is met. For loops are very, uh, well, I guess they, they're just a special case of a while loop is what a for loop is. And we use this when we wanna iterate over a list of objects. And what I mean by iterate is go over each individual uh, like list or each individual object in the list and do some, some process for it. So you don't really need a condition. I mean, you can make the condition that once you finish the, the, the list of objects that you're going over, um, then you stop. But that we, like people realize that they do this this specific case of a while loop many 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 times all the time that they actually just made it its own loop, um, so you don't have to worry about the code because a while loop to iterate over the number zero through six is kind of tedious. It's like four lines. It gets even more tedious if you have a lot more code that you're writing. So a for loop is kind of like a quick and dirty way of doing that. It's not quick and dirty, but a quicker and easier way of doing that. 
So the easiest way to iterate over a list of objects is a for loop. Um, so for an example of this might be, let's say you want to iterate over all the rows in a data file. Maybe it's your Excel spreadsheet. Um, you want to go over all the different rows in that CSV or, or data file that you're in, and you want to pull all those data values out and use them elsewhere. Well, you can do that with a for loop really easy, like in two lines, basically. So some common uses might be to perform some operations to a specific subset of data. Maybe you want to populate a new list with values from the data. Um, typically, any operation you need to repeat many times with some variation or little variation um, is definitely what you're going to use a for loop for. And heuristically, um, this is kind of how you write one. So for an index in some iterable, an iterable can, is just something that you can iterate over. So a list, you can go, you can iterate over a list, every index in a list, you can iterate over a range of numbers. It could be, it could be a, a wide range of different things. Um, but that's the, the, the we're, we're index or ugh, we're saying for index in this iterable, meaning uh, for every object inside of this iterable, do some stuff for each index. So that's a little hard to say uh, or a bit of a tongue tire. In fact, uh, I think it's kind of funny. I think Dr. Seuss would have said it like this um, for thing and a bunch of things, do some stuff for each thing and a bunch of things. Um, I came up with that and I thought that was really funny. But yeah, that's how I think that's how Dr. Seuss would say it. Uh, so that same example of printing numbers zero through six, it only takes two lines to do it with a for loop. So for i, i just being a dummy variable that we set as the index, you could actually write out index if you wanted to, it's totally fine, it's just a variable. Um, for i in range seven, so this is for all the numbers between zero and seven, not including the last number, um, print, the, print whatever that i index is. So for each, uh, for each like number in the range, all it's doing is it's saying, okay, so now i is zero. We're gonna start with i is zero, and then we're gonna print i, and then we add one to i, we're, or we're going to the next index in this range. So the next index in this uh, range is one, and we just keep going. So print one, and then we do it again for two, and then three, and then four, all the way to six. So it's really the exact same thing as this example, where x start is at, starts at zero, and we increment one to x every time. It's a lot more efficient. Um, and like not not as much code write. This example is only four lines of code as opposed to two. But when you have a lot more going on in your code, a for loop is a lot more efficient um, and easier to, to remember what's going on. So for each index in this range of numbers, just print what that index is. So we start at index zero, and then we go to index one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six. And I guess I should note, since this is a crash course on Python, um, every list or any, every list that Python uses or iterable starts with an index of zero. So if you want to access the very first letter in a word, say a, a word like Python, and it's, a, it's in the form of a string or the first value in a list that like you see, not necessarily the first index, but the first value that you can see, then you index it with zero. Um, just a little coding thing, but it's an important. Uh, it's important because it could be a source of frustration if you didn't know that. So I want to give you like a real applicable example of a for loop that I would use totally in my research if I was uh, if I needed to do this. Um, it was just some example that I thought up of. So let's say you have two lists of data values. Maybe you have apparent magnitudes for a star. That's log scale brightness essentially, um, and you have distances that you've measured, maybe that's from just like taking a spectrum of data, or you got them from Gaia or whatever it may be, but you have these apparent magnitudes, which is just a log scale measurement of brightness. And you have these distances to these objects um, in units of parsecs, of course, because um, we're astronomers. Well, then what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all these data values and actually create a list of absolute magnitudes that encode the, di the distance data inside of them. So you only have to deal with one list of values instead of two. And maybe this list of values is enormous. Maybe it's a million different stars. Um, I think the Gaia data set is on the order of millions of different objects that it's keep, like, that it's has data for. So maybe you need to do this over a million objects. It might take a while to work with two sets or two lists of a million objects as opposed to one. So that would be why we want to maybe truncate this and encode all the information in just one list. Um, so how do you do this? Well, let's just kind of dissect this whole example a little bit. 
So like I said before, these first two lists are the star data. That's what we pull from Gaia. Maybe that's pulling from a telescope data set um, that Kishore or Wei Kong or Alex sends you. Um, and then we create, like before we go over our for loop and, and create this new list of data values, we have to actually start with an empty list to fill. So we create this empty list that we're going to populate with transformed data. Um, in this case, I'm calling it absolute magnitudes because that we're going to switch from apparent magnitudes to absolute magnitudes. Um, and it has to be an empty list and you denote an empty list just by empty brackets, so empty square brackets. And then you have the for loop that you're actually going to be going over. So let's look at it. For i or for index in the range of the length of distances, this is probably one of the most common um, like lines I think I've ever written in Python. Um, range of length of distances. So breaking this down, distances is a list of different values. Len gives you the length of these distance values, or uh, of this, uh, or not the length of the distances, but the length of the entire list itself. So if the list had 100 objects in it, that len would be 100. If it had a million, it would be a million. Um, and so, so we're pulling the length of this distance list, and then we're going to actually create a range of, of numbers between 0 and whatever that number is. So if, if distances has 100 items in it, then what Len is doing is saying, OK, I'm going to say this is 100 items long. And then I'm going to make a range of from 0 to 100. And we're going to iterate over that each and every time with this dummy variable i. And we're going to keep track of what object we're on with i. So then you can, um, so here, just to be explicit, then we access each data value from each list with indexing by i. Um, to index into a list, you just use square brackets at the end of the name of the list and then whatever the index is. So in this case, i could be 0, it could be 1, it could be 2, it could be anything, any number, as long as it's not bigger than the entire length of the list. So i can be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Same thing. Uh, or, and so that way, we pull out the ith value in this entire list. So just starting with i equals 0, for example, so we're pulling the very first object or very first data value in the apparent magnitudes and the very first value in the distance lists. Um, so in the apparent magnitudes list in the distance list, and we're pulling them out. We're calling it m sub i because it's very temporary. We're only we're talking about the ith component of these lists, and we're only going to use it inside of this for loop. We're not going to use it anywhere else. So inside of this for loop, then we just use. Um, this equation that to convert from apparent magnitude to absolute magnitude. Um, it's not super important what the equation is, but what is important is that we're using those pulled ith values and then we're actually manipulating them. And then once we get this value that encodes both of them, so m sub i minus five times the log base 10 of d sub i over 10, it's not super important what this equation is, but we get this variable now, or we, 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 we store all that information in what's called, or in this variable, this temporary variable, we call m sub i, capital m sub i for absolute magnitude, the ith absolute magnitude. And then what we're going to do is we're going to append it into this empty list. So dot append is what we use to append a ith, or, or like append some value to a list. Um, so that list could be completely empty. And then this dot append will add one item at a time every time we go over this for loop which is really nice. Um, and then by the end of this entire for loop, you should have an absolute magnitudes list that is the length of these two lists, but it encodes all of their information in one single list. And that's really useful. And there are tons of applications almost exactly like this in astronomy or physics, wherever you are going to be coding, in your upper divisions or your lower division courses. Um, they're, they're, it's Python is becoming super relevant in every course at Berkeley. Um, so it's important that you see this example because it's very indicative of many research um, scenarios and as well as like class scenarios. So that's for loops. And lastly, we're going to talk about objects in Python. This is kind of the last um, key point about the basics and fundamentals of Python that is crucial um, if you want to know all about Python. But most people don't really know about it if they're in STEM um, because it's not really something that's super important. It's more of a CS thing. The, uh, than it is a physics or astronomy usable thing. But I still think it's relevant because it helps you understand a little bit more about how um, big libraries are built. Um, so an object in Python. How do you create an object in Python? Well, 
objects in Python are made using what's called a class. Um, any object made from a class takes on all the properties of a class. So a good example I like to think of heuristically is uh, a human object. How do you create a human in code? Um, well, it's difficult to create a human and difficult to create life, but in code, we can boil it down to some key things that every human has, every human has, um, that we can keep track of in our code. So let's say uh, every human has these following traits. In order to be a human, you have to have eye color, you have to have hair color, skin color, height, weight, I don't know, whatever it is you, you whatever traits you want to give a human being, um, they have these specific traits and that's kind of what makes them human. And then every human has these methods. Now, what, what is a method? Well, a method is kind of like an action or like a function that a human can do. So um, it's not so much a trait, but a human can jump. A human can run and they can clap and they can skip and push and talk and think. These are things that a, 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 a human object should be able to do um, their methods, their, their functions that um, like they're, they're more verbs than anything, but they're, they're things that a human object should be able to do. And we call those methods. So jumping and running and clapping and so on. Um, and that all belongs to a human class object. So to, to create a human object, you, they need to be part of this human class that we're creating. Um, and this is how you would write it in code. Um, don't worry too much if you don't really understand all the code. I'm going to do my best to parse through it. Um, this is more or less something you can Google um, with Stack Exchange and stuff if you want to know the details. But I'm going to give you just like the main key ingredients of how you create a class of objects. So it always starts with a class definition. Um, and the way you do that is just class. You write the word class in your code and then space and then the name of the class. So in this case, we're calling it a human class. Don't forget your colons. Um, and then inside of that class, you have to have one thing at least that's super important, and that's called the constructor function. You cannot create any objects from a class without a constructor function. I like to think of it as like the creation function. In order to create an object from a class with all these traits and stuff in it, you need to have some sort of function that handles creation of the object. So if I want to create a human, I need this we also call it initialization function, a constructor or initialization function. And that's denoted by, it's the same, um, we, we start the same as a normal function, this def statement, that's the defining statement of this function, but the constructor or the initialization function is specific, like has a specific syntax. And what we call it is underscore, underscore init, short for initialization, underscore, underscore. This has to be the name, it does not change. Um, when you're creating, uh, like when you're making the creation or the constructor or the initialization function, it's all the same thing. Um, but you need that underscore, underscore, in it, underscore, underscore name for the code Python to know what you're talking about. And then it always takes in first this argument self. And that's a little weird and kind of confusing if it's the first time you're seeing it. But the way I like to think of it is normally when you're actually calling um, a human object that you're making, you actually don't put anything there for self but it's a way of Python keeping track of um, what the object is that it's creating. So it's creating itself, if that makes sense. Um, and then what, anything after that are like, um, are, uh, can be variable. So maybe in, for this uh, very short case or, or, um, or for this very like basic case, I'm saying that in order to create a human, they have to have an age and a height. That's it. Like those are the base base things that they need to have, and they can be different between different people. Not every human has the same age, and not every human has the same height. So when I go to create a human, I need to have some way of changing the age and height per human. So um, the first argument in our initialization or creation function is going to be age, and then the second one is going to be height, and then we assign those two those two arguments, those two variables as traits to this human object. And the traits go inside of your initialization function. So when I create a human, they're born with traits. They have to have these traits that they stay with. Um, and that will be the age and that will be the height. And we do like, we give, we assign an object um, its traits by doing the self dot age notation or self dot whatever notation. And that gives it a trait. So self dot age is giving a age trait to the human class. 
self.height is giving a height trait to the human class. And we set those equal to whatever the input age and the input height is from the constructor function. Sorry, I need to take some water. Okay, so once we've assigned those traits to whatever a human object is, just make sure, or just like, so whenever I create a human, they will be in initialized or they will be created with these traits inherently. And I said that these traits have to be dependent on however I create the human. So I specify what the age and the height of the human are. Those are its born traits um, when, I, when I create it or initialize it and I create a human object. And then lastly, we can have optional methods. So methods for an object in the class um, are also just, they're basically just functions. They, you code them the same way you would normally code functions, like I described way back in the very beginning of what I was talking about um, several slides back. So it's always denoted by this defining statement, def, and then the name of your method. So in this case, I'm creating an action for this human to be able to do, and that's grow. Every human grows um, over time. So I'm creating a growth function so, or a growth method to this human object. And it doesn't take anything in. Um, we, always, we always start, any method always starts with the self, and that's a way of keeping, of Python keeping track of what that method is being applied to. So, and always put self, and then any other arguments are optional. But in this case, it, it, like, I don't need anything to grow in my function, so that's okay. Or I don't need anything to use to grow, so I'm not gonna incorporate that in there. But what I am going to do is say that this growth function adds one to the human's height. And this plus equals is just shortened in, in syntax for saying self height is equal to self height plus one. Um, it's just a short uh, shortcut syntax. Um, but so just to recap, to define a human or to define any class, you need to have a class statement, defining class statement, and then the name of the class. And then you have to have an initialization or constructor function. This is absolutely crucial being able, being able to make objects from your class. And then inside of that initialization constructor function, we assign traits to a class of ob or uh, like a, a, a object class. And then we can have optional methods outside of that initialization function, but still within the class um, that ch make changes to the object or um, they're, they're like actions that the object can do. Uh, so in this case, I have one that makes it grow, which means it adds plus one to its height, or it, it adds um, an inch to its height or whatever you want to call the, uh, the units of this object. Um, it's not super, super important that you understand what objects are. It's just one of the absolute backbones of what makes Python so powerful. Um, it's object-oriented programming, and it's very important in machine learning, and it's important in um, artificial intelligence, and it's important and even in something like plotting, actually, it's in the back end of, of you don't really see the object oriented side of it, but it's, it's everywhere. Um, it's, it's incredibly important. It's kind of what makes uh, like Python such a high level language that's very useful um, is object oriented programming. So that's the basics. Um, this is kind of like my two thirds slash three quarter, no, yeah, two thirds mark of the lecture and it's 350. So I just want to let everybody um, know, like keeping aware of time. Um, it will, I'll have probably another 20 minutes or so left of, of talking. So take that as you will. But external libraries, um, this is a very important topic in Python because it's kind of what makes, some, what makes it powerful for astronomers and physicists and STEM people. Um, we don't really care about all the very basic stuff we care more about the different libraries and tools that people have developed that we can use to analyze data. Maybe that's fitting a function to, or like a, like a model curve function to data. Maybe that's plotting the data that we take from our telescopes um, and so on. There's all the sorts of different examples. And luckily lots of really, really smart coding people figured all this out and they made these really nice libraries that we can use um, that make our lives a lot easier. So something that would be really, really difficult, like coding up a whole interface to display pictures on your screen um, that requires like a whole bunch of implementation and many thousands of lines of code. If you did it absolutely from scratch, only takes like two lines.
for us, which is amazing and so nice and it helps everybody out tremendously. So external libraries are incredibly powerful. And so how do we make our code more powerful? Powerful? Well, you need, first you need to import these external libraries. So we use what's called import statements. So, some libraries, I refer to these as libraries, they're giant compilations of, um, of functions and tools that people have developed and written inside of their own packages and these, li we, they call them libraries. So the map library is this entire, I like, I like to think of it as a library, this entire library of functions that you could just pick and pull at your choosing. Um, let's say you wanted a natural logarithm function. Well, it's kind of a pain in the butt to code that up but somebody already did that for you. And all you have to do is just say natural, like import math. I want to import this math library. And then I just want to use the, the natural logarithm function from there. And then Python will know exactly what you're doing as long as you have it installed, or as long as you've downloaded that entire library. And a lot of them come with Python when you install it, depending on how you install it, but that's just good to know. So some different, some examples of libraries that are really powerful math, random so like math it's pretty self-explanatory if you ever want to do like any math other than just basic arithmetic that a calculator can do um the math library is a very good useful resource then random is also really nice uh, if you ever want to generate random data maybe make some random values between these two numbers maybe you want to make a random data set maybe you want to make some noise um for your code or whatever or to add to, to error or whatever um, random is very useful. I like to use it in the scope of making a random die generator, but that's just the little CS guy in me. Um, so then there's also the NumPy library. We'll talk a little bit more about NumPy later. Um, there's also the SciPy library if you want to use scientific tools. Um, and then there's Matplotlib, which is how we, well, this is a library that we use to plot data and make really pretty plots and graphs. So you can import packages and libraries so that you don't have to write your own functions. I said this earlier, but I just want to iterate that one more time to you because it's very important. Um, that's the whole point of a library is to use packages and library or packages and functions that we don't have to code ourselves. That's what makes them so powerful um, is that you can use other people's work in the same way that um, there's no point in rederiving general relativity. Um, you could just use Einstein's equations, right? As long as you believe them. Um, it's kind of a very similar concept. We, we build off of the people that came before us. And so we're building off of the functions that have already been written for us from other people in, the form, in, their, in their libraries that they've made. So um, how would you calculate the median of a list of 10 unordered numbers? Well, that might be kind of difficult to do to code up yourself in Python. It probably takes maybe 10 lines of code or something like that to actually do it from scratch. But you could just use one function from the NumPy library, for example. You just use numpy.median, and it takes care of that instantly. Super easy. Um, and it calculates that and for a huge list or whatever list you want. So it's really nice. It's a very useful um, shortcut to make our code powerful. So how do you import a package? How do you actually do it, though? So the way you write this in your code, you would write this normally at the very beginning of your code file in your Jupyter Notebook, or maybe it's a Python script or whatever, you have to import some package, whatever it's called, the package name. Maybe it's maybe it's the Astro Pips package that UK has developed, or maybe it's the NumPy library, the SciPy library, whatever it is. You're importing this package or library as like whatever its name at, like you're importing it by calling its name. So import whatever that name of that library is, and then as an alias. And this alias is what we're gonna be calling it and referencing it as, throughout the code. So for an example for this, or an example of this might be, instead of calling NumPy, NumPy all the time, because that gets really cumbersome to write out, especially if these packages have long names, um, you import NumPy as this NP alias. And you can think of NP as like a variable that's just keeping track of the entire NumPy library that you can use. So that's one example you could do with matplotlib.pyplot. For example, it would be a real pain in the rear end to have to type out matplotlib.pyplot every time you wanted to make a plot. But you could just use an alias called plt um, to reference any function out of that entire library. Same thing with like astropy, which is another awesome library that's useful. So these are our 
different libraries and this is how you would impl or you import them into your code so that you can use any function from their library um, that like you might want to use. And there's other ways of writing this. There's different syntaxes for importing. If you want to import an entire library, you don't even use this as NP. You don't really need to. You could just import NumPy and it will take every single function from the NumPy library and put it in your code by their name. So if there's a function called uh, calculate distance squared, you would not have to do NP dot calculate, calculate distance squared anymore. You could just use the name of the function. But I do warn you, if you are using more than one library, um, some libraries have the same name. For example, SciPy and NumPy have overlapping functions that they've written that have the same name. Um, and Python can get confused. And so it won't know which one to use. So if you want to use a specific one, then I recommend keeping these aliases. I actually recommend that you do this all the time. Um, I think it's the I think it's the least confusing one, um, and it causes the least amount of errors. Similarly, you can also there's one third extra importing um, packages, uh, I guess format you could say, and that's when you want to import only one function from the entire library, or maybe it's two, like just a, like enough that you actually know them by their name and you're calling and you only want to use them that one function or those two functions or whatever it may be, and that would be a from this package import blank. So from NumPy import. I don't know, the standard deviation function. And that's the only one I want. Um, I'm not, I didn't put these on the slides because I don't really think they're super important and crucial to understanding, but I'm just letting you know that there are, if you see that syntax otherwise, just know that it is a, it is a semi-common um, practice for some people. But I think this is the, the most clear and it causes the least amount of confusion and errors in your code is to follow this kind of formatting when you import packages. So again, import the package name as an alias. So import numpy as np, import matplotlib.pyplot as plot, and astropy.units as you import. Import name as whatever you want to reference it as. Um, and then generally, you put all this at the beginning of your code. And what's called the preamble is what we call it. Or at least that's what I call it. And I've been told is what it's called. So numpy. I talked about this earlier. It was the first one I talked about uh, of packages and what is it? How do you use NumPy? What is it? Um, well, I already told you how to import it and it just has a bunch of functions that you can use in your code. Um, but what NumPy is and what it is useful for is important to know. So um, what kind of makes NumPy NumPy is its arrays feature. So arrays I like to think of are just really fancy lists that are a lot easier to use. They have a lot more uh, tools that you can use with these arrays than you can with just a normal standard Python list. And honestly, arrays are the way to go. I always, always use arrays over lists at this point um, because NumPy is just so nice to work with. So you can also calculate mean, median, max, min, standard deviation, variance, blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't even know. Any, any statistics you could possibly need is probably calculatable using um, the NumPy library. Furthermore, um, you can do multi-dimensional arrays. So if you had a 2D array, maybe you want to have all the pixels mapped out on your CCD, or you're taking a, a, a like a BBRI image from a FITS file from Nickel or Kate, and you want to bring it into your Python file um, and work with it as, the, as, a, as an array, you can actually keep track of it and plot it on your screen as like a, a map, like a 2D map. Um, with grid lines and stuff. It's very, very useful. And 3D arrays are more like this Rubik's Cube type looking thing I got going on here. This is more what a 3D array is. Typically, you don't need to use 3D arrays unless you're doing some heavy computational stuff. But 1D and 2D, 2D arrays are very useful. And a 2D array is just like a matrix. So you can actually do linear algebra with this library, which is really cool. Um, you could take eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and you can um, you can change bases and all sorts of cool stuff with uh, linear algebra in this library. And then you can do like vector manipulation too, because um, yeah, you can treat a 1D array, which is just a, a glorified list um, with a lot of fancy extra features. You can treat it as a vector and use it in that way, respect to in your linear algebra. Um, so that's really nice. A lot of very nice use utility with the NumPy library. And then I want to talk about matplotlib. This is arguably the most important library to, to use. Uh, I can see something in the chat. 
Oh, cool. Um, sorry, my throat gets dry. So matplotlib, yeah, like I said, it's the, arguably the most important or most useful library uh, out of all of the libraries I'll talk about today. Um, because us as scientists, we need to visualize our data. Visualizing data is very important. It's how it's oftentimes how we learn valuable insights. And as someone once told me, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I couldn't agree more. Um, just looking at these data or at these um, plots, I mean, it conveys a lot of information as opposed to many countless paragraphs in a research paper. So with matplotlib, you can make lots of very useful visualizations of your data. You can make one-dimensional plots, just x versus y or y versus x. You make two-dimensional plots that look like these right here, that look like these, like that you might have seen in your multivariable calculus classes or fractals that look really pretty. Um, these are more two-dimensional plots and you can plot like a 2D array as, um, as like a data file and you can put like, pl you can plot that on a plot that, that you can visualize with the color map. Um, you can animate plots if you wanted to with matplotlib. I'm not gonna talk about that today because it's fairly advanced, but you can do it. You can make corner plots. A lot of you have seen that in research papers um, I'm not going to talk about how to make corner plots because it's a little bit more advanced. And you can also make histograms, which you can use in those corner plots. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, these are just a, a small fraction of the possibilities you can create. In fact, I've even, I forgot to cite the Hoffman paper, but I took this plot right off of UK and Andrew's um, research paper on M15. And, and it looks really nice. And if you spend a lot of time with matplotlib, you can make your plots look very beautiful, just like this one. I hope he's a little flattered, or I hope UK is a little flattered by this plot. Um, and then I just took some some screenshots or some plots that I've made elsewhere. This is something I made in Astro 160, for example, um, plotting spectra. You can plot all sorts of good stuff. There's tons of tons of valuable information that could be encoded in plots. So how do you do it? Um, how do you plot a curve? This is a very valuable skill to know how to do with Python. Um, in fact, I would prioritize this right after learning the basics is learning how to plot something. So let's say I want to plot a curve. And specifically, I want it to look like this. I want to have this nice smooth curve of a quadratic function. Well, the way you do that is you have to connect the dots between, or you have to plot a lot of dots down on this, on this graph and then connect the dots. And the more dots you put, the smoother the curve will look because you're just connecting the dots with these lines. So just like you, if you study calculus, just like in calculus, the, the higher the resolution, the smoother the curve becomes, the better the, better the approximation. So um, the way we make a lot of different values between, like, um, between a range of numbers is this function from NumPy called np dot, or like linspace, but we call it from the NumPy library. So we refer to it as np dot linspace. Again, going back to the package names, import NumPy as NP. We're using the entire NumPy library here and we're denoting it as this NP alias. And we're saying we're accessing any function from there by using this dot notation. So you can think of this function as actually a method for the NumPy object, which is kind of referring back to this object oriented programming idea that I was talking about earlier. So the linspace is this linspace function is actually a method of the NumPy library um, object. So what is linspace? Well, it takes three different arguments, typically. Um, the first is like the, the starting point of your range of numbers you want to create. And then the end point is the second one. So in this case, I'm creating 100 evenly spaced numbers between 0 and 3. And that is what linspace is doing. It creates, 100, like it creates however many end points you want between 0 and 3, or between your starting and ending index. And it makes them evenly spaced. So that when you go to plot, um, you have a ton of intermediate values in between here. And you can raise this resolution or decrease the resolution depending on the computational ex like expense of it. If you need a trillion data points, it's gonna take a lot of time for your computer to run through all of that. But if you only need 100, it takes it like maybe a picosecond, not a picosecond, but like a millisecond or, a, or an order less than a second. Um, and then what we're gonna do is apply it as a function. Now, normally with a list, you'd have to do a for loop and a whole bunch of annoying business, but 
NumPy was written for scientists and they know exactly how we want to be able to do things. So um, instead of doing all that for loop business with a, with a list, what makes it uh, like a NumPy array, which is what Linspace is, numpy.linspace spits out an array um, that we're assigning to X. What you can do with a NumPy array is actually just apply operations to it. And so when you do X squared, this, this double asterisk is denoting squaring um, as opposed to one just being multiplication. Two is, is um, or two is applying to the power of, so X double asterisk two is X to the power of two. Um, and it's applying this to the power of two to every single value in this X list or this X array. So instead of a whole for loop, we have to iterate over every single value and square every single one and create a whole new list to append all those values to. All you have to do is just say X squared and Python know, or the NumPy Python interface knows exactly what you mean. And it squares every value in the X array, which is amazing. So easy to work with. So then if you want to actually plot this value, you use the PLT, which is just matplotlib. Uh, if we, we see here, it's just importing this whole matplotlib pyplot library as this PLT alias. We're just referencing the plot function from it. And we're just saying that plot.plot, .plot, this is the plot function. This is how you visualize data. Um, then we're just saying x and y. x is the independent variable, and y is the dependent variable. And we, may, we defined x and y above. And then when you run this, it gives you this really pretty plot. Um, the black background is just because we want to match the slides, but actually it gives you a white background, um, but just letting you know that. So that is how you would plot this, like uh, just an X squared graph. Um, you define an X array of, that's an independent variable. I'm using Linspace to make it evenly spaced data points. The higher the resolution, the bigger the N, that's the third argument here. Um, and then you, we apply, an operation or uh, like a, we apply a change to that entire array of values and we call that y. So y is equal to x squared means we're squaring every value in the np.lin space array, um, which is just a bunch of numbers between zero and three. And we don't even have to use a for loop because numpy is amazing and people who wrote numpy are geniuses. Uh, so then we can just plot the x and y and it makes this nice pretty plot. You can plot multiple curves, so you can create another. You can make, you create another lens space, for example, um, between zero and two pi. So notice we're accessing a constant from the net, the, the NumPy library. Um, pi, so np dot pi, is a pi is a trait, right? Referring back all the way to the the NumPy object oriented programming. Dot pi is is a is a trait because there's no function but it's just a, a value that the, this NumPy object has, which is kind of nice to, to know. But anyway, so we're going from zero to two pi with 100 evenly spaced values in between. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plot x, or, or like sine of x versus x, and then cosine of x versus x. And it's nice and easy. This is like saying y is equal to np dot sine of x. It's, we're just putting that, uh, this is the dependent um, val variable or yeah, dependent variable for both these plots. And since we have two different plotting statements, plot dot plot, it's gonna put them both on the same curve. And then this plot dot show is just to make it look pretty at the end. But since we have two for the same figure, um, it's gonna plot both of them. And it automatically picks the color and stuff, but that's not super important. Um, I'm on time, yeah, I'm a bit over time, but it's okay. Uh, so that's how you plot multiple curves on the same graph then maybe you want to plot just the data points. You don't want to make it a nice smooth curve, but you want to have like actual individual data points. Um, this is very useful for actually plotting data, not just a, like a theoretical function. So let's just create, we're going to use the random part of this NP library. It's not, the syntax is not super important here, but we could have used actually, we could have just used the random library itself, but I didn't want to import a whole nother library. So anyway, we're just saying, we're using some random function from X or, or from NumPy and we're generating a list of random values between zero and 20. And we're gonna just plot them for X and Y. And we're gonna, the way we plot them as data points is using this plot.scatter function, which is different than the plot.plot .plot function we used before. So just to emphasize, plt.plot gives you a smooth curve and plt.scatter gives you like scatter plot. Um, we just plot X and Y which is y versus x, and then we plot dot show to make it a nice pretty at the end. And you get this. Oh, sorry, uh, I 
I read this wrong. It's 20 data points between zero and one. My apologies. That's just how the function is defined. It's not super important how you get the data points, but once you have a list or arrays of data points, you can use them and plot them on the plots, which is really nice. And you can create this nice little scatter plot. And then you can put different types of plots on the same one, just like how we did before with the multiple um, smooth curves on the same one. We can actually put a plt.scatter and a plt.plot on the same graph. So this is not super important, but what we're doing is we're generating a smooth curve with sine of x and then shift it a little bit and then make like just put a bunch of data points. So it's just making mock data. Um, and what we're doing is creating the smooth curve and the actual data curve um, so like next to it. And in practice, this is like comparing your actual data to your model, right? If you think, if you look at a variable star, for example, that's pulsating in brightness and you have dots for the light curve from observations and you want to uh, compare your smoothed out sinusoidal curve for, I don't know, an AB star, for example, or no, no, it's a C star that's the sinusoidals. Sinusoidal um, and you want to just see if it fits the sinusoidal curve, you can actually plot them both on the same graph. Now, if you actually wanted to fit a model to it, it's a little different, use the sci-fi library for that, but we don't have time to talk about that today. I just wanted to show you that you can plot multiple, you can plot real data and a model on the same graph. Uh, and the way you do that is just put multiple like statements on this in the same figure. So plt.plot, then plt.scatter, and you end the figure by creating it or by writing plot.show and that ends the figure. So astronomers have the best plots. This is a quote that somebody, I think Elon told me, my friend Elon, who's in the, in the department. It's true, astronomers should have the best plots. We make really pretty graphs. We get to look at the most pretty things in the universe and that's stars and Milky Ways and um, exploding stars and all sorts of stuff. So we should also have the prettiest plots. So there's lots of different optional arguments. You notice I didn't put any of these arguments before on previous slides, just because they're optional. The computer will just kind of pick a random one for you and make it look nice according to it. But if you want to make it look nice to your own eye, you have to specify certain things about it. So you, you could change opacity by referring to this alpha variable. You, you can change the size of the line that you're creating or the data points you're creating. You can change the color of the data points. You can even change what markers the data points are. Maybe you don't want dots or circles. Maybe you want stars or triangles or something interesting like that. You can totally choose that. Um, there's lots of different uh, optional variations you can make. You can add labels to your plots um, with strings. So in this case, plt.x label is pretty self-explanatory. It takes that plot that we made and adds an x label. And the x label is whatever string you want to put in it. In this case, I just put x and y, but you can make it whatever you want. Maybe it's temperature. Maybe it's, maybe it's the word temperature. And that's how you would get a plot that looks like, um, like time or like temperature, or you could put like a whole sentence there if you wanted to. It's how you put power on the y-axis and so on, period. Um, that's like, you can change the labels. They're just optional arguments that you can add to your figure to make them look nicer. Um, yeah, and then there's, there is a different way of doing this. Everything I showed you is the state machine approach. Uh, it's not super important. If you're really curious, you can come ask me. Um, the difference between object-oriented matplotlib and state machine approach matplotlib. Um, but this is the quick and dirty version. Typically, um, there's a kind of a different treatment you need to use if you're going to make subplots. Um, I don't really have time to talk about all about subplots today. Um, but if I do a follow-up lecture, I will be happy to give like a whole thing on plotting. Um, and then also I put a link here if you want to learn how to make color friendly or, or colorblind friendly plots. Um, you can also check that link out too. We give you some guidelines. So I'm almost done. Lastly, I just want to say a couple points about some other libraries that are really useful. I just don't really have time to talk about today. Um, other ones are SciPy. Um, SciPy is incredibly useful for numerical differentiation, numerical integration, curve fitting, root finding. If you're not familiar with what curve fitting and root finding are, I highly encourage you to take a course that talks about these um, these different numerical techniques. We teach it in the Python decal, and we also they also teach it in Physics 77 if you want to take that or Physics 88. Um, incredibly useful tool, tools that are used everywhere in science, especially if you want to do anything that with actual data. 
um, I, I encourage you to look or to take a course on that. Um, but yeah, you can you can differentiate, you can integrate um, numerically, which is very useful for like simulations and whatnot. And, um, yeah, so SciPy is just very useful in that respect. AstroPy is more of a convenience um, than anything, at least in my opinion. But you, there also there is also some really valuable things you can use it for. Say if you're using Gaia data, um, it's really useful for unit conversion if you want to work with units on a homework assignment. I almost always use it instead of a regular calculator because it can change units and do unit conversions for you like on the fly, really easy. You can change the CGS or SI units, really nice. Um, you could read in .fits files. So almost all telescope data is converted to .fits files, which encode lots of different, lots of information, not just like an Excel spreadsheet, but it also keeps like pixel values and bright, like, and um, like, array, like array values and, a whole bunch of just information um, that formatted in a special way and dot fits files is kind of the main data file that astronomers like to use um, or observational astronomers like to use. So you can read those in with AstroPy, which is really nice. It has a specific format for reading those dot fits files. Um, you can do coordinate transformations from RA and DEC, which is like the J2000. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what the actual proper word is or name is for the RA and DEC coordinate system. But you can convert to galactic coordinate system um, if you're doing uh, like analyses of stars in Mil the Milky Way. Um, you can convert between coordinates, which is really easy and nice with AstroPy, and then you can do table manipulations and so on. Lastly, is the pandas library I want to talk about. Um, pandas is really useful for file I/O, which is just another way of saying of creating data files, opening data files, accessing data files, um, writing to them, and then converting like um, converting your data to LaTeX tables to export to like an Overleaf um, research paper project or whatever. If you want to put your data table on like a research paper, you want to convert to LaTeX. Pandas can do that for you, which is really nice. Um, I think Pandas is a really, really useful uh, library for working with large amounts of data. And it was actually developed by the people over at Facebook. Um, so they really know what they're doing. In fact, the documentation page for that is I think 500 pages long. Um, or no, thousands, I, I can't remember. It's really long, uh, really extremely well documented. But uh, those are three libraries that I didn't really get the chance to talk about today because I just don't have the time. But um, if we do a follow-up lecture on this, I could talk about them a lot more in depth. Uh, yeah, that is everything I have for today. Um, furthermore, I just want to remind everybody that there is the optional assignment that I, I sent via email. Um, I will be sending out solutions to that sometime today. I'm hoping, if not by then, then by tomorrow. And then I also gave two um, like guidance uh, notebooks that are um, nice references. And if you don't know how to actually uh, open up those notebooks, don't worry. Please email me. My email is jamesandsari at berkeley.edu. You can check the email. Um, and I will be happy to walk you through installation of Python if you don't know how to do that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to cover that today. I just didn't have the time. But yeah, that, that is everything I have today. So I'm going to stop recording.